Okay, Steve, I'm not a scientist, but I'm somebody who wants to know a lot about the practical sides of it. And I was listening to you much earlier, and you were talking about the Thorium community, and you were mentioning how international it is and how diverse it is. And later on, I heard you talk about a lot of the experiments being done in Japan. The one word I didn't hear was the word China. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine a subject of this nature not bringing China in. So what is the story with China when it comes to thorium? Are they allies? Are they competitors? Are they opponents? Bring China into the picture for me. They're all three. They are allies. They are competitors. They are opponents. China is a bizarre case. Right now, here in the United States, it's illegal to do what I want to do. So I can't do it. China. What, what is it you want? I want, to, I want to mess around in my lab right here. I want to get the world's first molten salt reactor going. And what is illegal about that in the United States? I can't touch the thorium. I can't use thorium as a fuel. No national laboratory will support me to do the, the nuclear work on their campus. Can't do any of it. Because it's a radioactive material. It's right. It's radioactive, but for a host of political reasons that have nothing to do with the, 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 the thorium part. China, on I believe January 26th of 2011, publicly announced that they are dedicating $5 billion toward thorium molten salt research. Okay, molten salt research in general and thorium molten salt research in particular. Right now, they are working with Westinghouse in China to, to work on molten salt cooled reactors. In other words, use the molten salt, not as the fuel like I was talking about before, but just merely as the working fluid, just to transfer the heat, because it's a great heat transfer medium. That's, so, so that's maybe good, okay? The bad is, and the ugly, is that because there's no work going on here in the United States, there can't be. And there isn't for political, very, very political reasons. I will ask you to explain those political reasons. I will, and I'm, and I'm grudgingly going to, yeah, I'm grudgingly <laughs> going to answer you. They are going to use our own patent office against us. They are going to file the intellectual property here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office down in Washington, D.C., and they are going to lock up what is, what could be a nascent and perhaps burgeoning industry here in the United States. And we won't be able to touch it. But you said they're partnering with Westinghouse, which is an American company. Sure. Okay, sure. And how is that going? So, so now, basically, you've basically given carte blanche to Westinghouse to work with the Chinese and have a lock on it. That is not American ingenuity. That is not American competition. I have no idea what Westinghouse is going to do with it. What if Westinghouse is going to do nothing? and not do it here because the political liability is too great. I have no idea. The problem is I don't have the choice and I don't have the option. And what I do see is I, I see a very big country like China who has a hell of a lot of money and owns a hell of a lot of our debt and can come right here to United States soil and, and lock it up. But lock what up? The lock energy up the market? Lock up the intellectual property. Let's say they lock up the intellectual property. Sure. Let's let's sure. let's say they lock up the intellectual property. Worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, they will want to sell things here, yes. and they will take the profits home. That's what we're worried about. With that's, that's one of the reasons. Okay. One of the things we're worried about. I could name well, thirty things. Well, okay. I was going to say, why do we care? Since you are making a very big point that the reason this is all important to you is to the health of the planet. Mm -hmm. and for the health of the oceans, and for the planet that your children will inherit and that their great-great-grandchildren will inherit. Who cares whether this planet is kept healthy and the money goes into Chinese pockets or my pockets or Saudi Arabian pockets? Why do we care? National security is one. Why in Congress was the purchase of a telecommunications company by China voted down? Not two, three months ago. National security. We need to care about what goes on within our borders. We do. Any country does. 
any, I, I'm not special because I'm American. You care if you're Czech, you care if you're German, you care if you're French, you care if you're Canadian. You have to care. You have to care about national security. Giving away a fabulous energy platform that could, that could power today, today's America and, and the, the same America a thousand years from now, because we have a thousand years worth of thorium right on the United States soil. Wow. And then give that away? And then not even be able to exploit it for ourselves? But wouldn't we be able to license the patent? Okay. For how much money? Who's going to come up with it? Is it is it is it yet again going to? Are we yet again going to be be beholden to to gargantuan corporations? This co I, I I know this sounds cliche, okay, but I actually do believe in the American dream. I actually do believe that sixty percent of the employment in the United States right now is for small businesses. I do believe that we for. Since, since the inception of the United States Patent and Trademark Office was the, with the signage of the first patent in 1790. I think like April 14th, 1790. <laughs> but who's counting? Okay, but who's counting? We have a long history of American invention and innovation. This can't be locked up. We are being stifled. We are being locked down with the dreaded America Invents Act, which was just uh, brought into enforcement on March 15th of this year. What is that act? It's first to file, not first to invent. I am a scientist. The thing that I value most is my laboratory notebook. Okay, because that's where I keep all, that's where I track everything. And that's where inventions are documented. That's why I have to write in black ink. Okay, because it's a legal document. Okay, with the passage of the America Invents Act, which is now in enforce, I'm not, I can't invent anything anymore. Okay, I have to file it first in order to be called first inventor. My laboratory notebook no longer has the status that it has had since the inception of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. That's a very fundamental paradigm shift here in the United States. That's bad. In essence, the America Invents Act says it's first to file. So in other words, if I sneak in here and I take a peek at your notebook and I run in and file for a patent tomorrow, you're out of luck. You got it. Okay, gotcha. You got it. Worst case scenario, you got it. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. Now that has to do with the ineptitude of the United States Congress. But with, with, with this confluence of events, the Chinese can lock this up, lock this technology up. Okay? This, is the, this, is, this is the land of invention and innovation. I actually still believe what I read it and was taught in my history books. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that, and I, sh and, and I can tell you right now that American ingenuity, American invention, and lots of robust scientists, a lot of them a hell of a lot smarter than I am, are ready, willing, and able to go to town on this. And we can make Wall Street a ton of money, we can make medical isotopes for, for all of North America, we can make exotic stuff, stuff that I like to play with, um, because it's very, they have very interesting physics and chemistry. We can have, like I said before, a robust, clever, diversified energy landscape. Not only for just now, but for the next thousand years. We can do it. And we can do it, I would argue, better than anybody else. Because we've been doing it so, for such a long time here in the U.S. Well, this is... Then help me understand something. From the way you describe molten salt reactors, in general, and thorium reactors in particular, it's a no-brainer. This is a win-win situation. It's not, a new, it's not a new technology. It's been around for decades. Agreed. But they are. They haven't proliferated. Correct. So why not? I'm going to give you multiple choice here, okay? There's an easy answer to this question, by the way. <laughs> No, go, go. go. Oh, uh, the multiple choice I was going to give you, and by the way, it's check off all that apply, right. but, I will, but I will make you explain, it's all right? It's fine. Is it politicians who are in the pocket of, the, of big oil and... Big nuke. Or big nuke or big coal? Uh, is, it, is it the people who are reliant on coal mining for their livelihood. Now, that doesn't only mean miners. That also means the people who run the stores that sell to miners. It's a whole economy. Absolutely. Derivative, uh, derivative markets, absolutely, yeah. Is it an environmentalist who hear the word nuclear and run for the hills? It's all of the above. Is it, well, I was going to say, but I'm going to ask you to elaborate on it. Is it 
regulators who don't know what they're doing? I mean, what's going on? Why? It's, it's, Why? it's all of the above. But then I need elaboration. Sure. Yeah. When I was writing one, a business plan, okay, one of my business plans that I wrote, and I, and I was first doing it, one of the first questions it says is, what barriers to entry can you put into place to prevent other competitors from coming in? Okay, this isn't conspiracy theory. This is right out of business school 101. Of course. Okay, so what has Big Nuclear done? They've done exactly what they're supposed to have done. They put huge barriers to entry, right, in place, starting from 1954 by, by including thorium, which, isn't, which would be marked wrong on any high school chemistry or physics test. It's not a fissile material. It's merely fertile. So we even, we even have a fundamental simple science mistake in the 1954 Atomic Energy Act. So, so Big Nuclear has put in massive barriers to entry, not only because nuclear is a very dangerous thing if, if improperly handled, right? So it has, you have to have a lot of regulation, but you've also made what could be a fabulous civilian energy platform because you can't make weapons grade stuff with it. You've effectively made it illegal. You've been talking about thorium. Yes, I'm talking about thorium. Yeah. yeah. Molten salt reactors. Don't even worry about thorium. Molten salt reactors in general. It is a fabulously better heat transfer platform. Right. Well, but all 104 of the operating nuclear reactors here in the United States, every single one of them uses a solid fuel. Do you know the costs that would be associated with trying to switch over to a molten salt reactor? They would be unfathomably enormous. You can't, you have to start from scratch. So I get it, I get it. It's a simple economics argument, I get it. But, but let us in. But where are the environmentalists? Environmentalists, another great, environmentalists and miners, environmentalists. They have unfortunately seen the decades of lousy reactor design. So in other words, they're hearing the word nuclear and they go, nuclear and running for the hills. New, listen. Nuclear energy is the safest form of energy known to man. It is, for the amount of energy that we get, the amount of electricity that's produced, it's amazingly safe, amazingly safe. The problem is poor stewardship. The problem is poor design, right? So we get boatloads of very, very clean, extraordinarily safe energy, okay, out of it. The problem is, is that through the confluence of events, history, the Cold War, all the other jazz, we've got lousy design and lousy thermodynamics transfer. So when you talk to an environmentalist, all they do is they get freaked out about the waste. Yes, the waste is a problem, but open your eyes. You said with thorium, the waste isn't a problem. Correct, correct, but you often, like you just said, you can't get past the nuclear. The moment you mention the word nuclear, the environment's, environmentalists run for the hills. Look at the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is still, ardently anti-nuclear. Now, we have very, very good people like Dr. Alex Canera uh, uh, out on the West Coast trying to change that. He's trying to change that attitude from, for, on, the, on the part of the Sierra Club, but it's really hard to do it. You mentioned the coal miners. Coal, coal, coal is getting screwed because coal is now more expensive than natural gas. And the coal miners have been duped into this nonsense that they're blaming Obama or they're, I don't care who to blame, don't blame it. Blame dollar signs. It's now cheaper to do natural gas than it is to do coal, period. To extract it or to burn it? Burn it, burn it. everything, Every, all of it. With, with, with the advent of horizontal uh, drilling and fracking, right, hydraulic fracturing, with the advent of these technologies, it is now cheaper to per BTU, or however you want to manage, measure the energy, it is now cheaper to burn natural gas than it is to burn coal. It's just, it, it's the bottom line. There's no conspiracy no, theory, that, there's no that, Democrats. That's been true for a while, yeah. Yes, it has. So now, deregulate thorium, create the thorium bank like John Kutch and Jim Kennedy are trying to do, have a safe place to put the thorium. There's nothing to worry about, okay, about the thorium, okay? But have a safe place if you're gonna worry about something that is so mildly radioactive. Bananas are actually more radioactive than the thorium. I don't know if you knew that, but the potassium-40 isotope in, in the banana is actually more radioactive than the I thorium. I just ate one. Right, yeah, right, you just ate a radioactive substance. And you let me do it. Well, and, right, and right before you did. <laughs> put the thorium in a bank, just like John Kutch and Jim Kennedy are trying to do. By doing that, you unlock the thousands and thousands of metric tons of rare earth elements that are allowed here in the United States. Do it. Guess what? Those coal miners know how to mine. 
guess what? If there's boatloads of jobs in Idaho where there happens to be a huge concentration of rare earths, or in North Carolina where there are alluvial rare earths, or in, in Florida where there are, are beach sands uh, of rare earths, anywhere in the country they'll go mine it. Wow, that's great work. Wow, it's mining work. Wow. You, you see what I'm saying? It's like, but I'm going to have to take it on faith because I don't know very much about mining. Are you telling me that the skill set needed to mine coal is the same skill set as the skill set? It's similar. Skills? It's yeah, similar. Yeah, are we talking transferable? Because yes. yes, absolutely. Because, because as, as much as Without I Without massive retraining that it actually but, but, No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's basically, I'm, I'm not a miner, but it's basically the same equipment. You, you, you're either stripping because of veins or in the alluvial case, you're taking it off the surface, or uh, like within, like in the hills of North Carolina, like at the base of the uh, of the Appalachian uh, Mountains, um, it's it's by and large the same skills. But it, it would, from playing devil's advocate on the question of job creation, it would, however, require huge, massive relocation. Okay, so. So, and if I say to you, I want you and your wife and your three children tomorrow to relocate to Alaska, I found you a good job. You're going to be very happy. If it were, if, if, yeah, if, 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 sure, and if it were paying me fat cash, sure. I would, I would challenge you to ask the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people working in the natural gas industry right now in Louisiana, in Texas, and in, in uh, Pennsylvania, where'd they come from? They came from everywhere else in the United States. Why? Because jobs are jobs. They're good jobs, they're quality jobs, they're well-paying, okay. they, you know, they have a reasonable safety uh, uh, factor. I'm sure there, there are, are egregious examples everywhere there are always bad apples, okay? But by and large, I would say if that was my training and I didn't go to grad school or whatever like I did or whatever, I'm gonna go to the jobs. It's a good paying job, I'll bring my family, it's a reasonable location, fine. Okay. I, I think that is a very fair cost-benefit analysis for the average father of, of, of three like me. I mean, the, the difference is, is that I'd much rather be here in my lab looking at atomic and subatomic structure. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> because that was my training and that's my passion. You know, you reminded me, when you were talking much earlier about the thorium community and saying it's pretty much unified, although of course there is dissent. There's... Are we talking about dissent about the, about the technology or about the environmental impact or about the costs? What are the sticking points within the thorium community? There, you have you have individuals who are of an older generation, okay? Uh, Dr. Robert Hargraves is an outstanding physicist, but he's older and he remembers when national laboratories meant national laboratories, big ideas, big science. We don't have that anymore. Unfortunately, our national laboratories aren't being utilized the way they were decades ago to make big science happen. It's not happening like that, unfortunately, anymore. Um, so that's one point of dissension. I personally think that we could still use national laboratories and I went to Los Alamos and talked to some fabulous chemists and physicists back in, in February when I gave my talk at, the, at the, the NETS conference in Albuquerque. I went to Los Alamos and I talked to a bunch of really great scientists and I know we've got world-class scientists so I know that we can do that but I don't think that there's enough political will in, in, in the halls of Congress to be able to pull that. Is the problem purely big nukes? In, excuse me, in Congress. In Congress, I think, I think almost exclusively. It's, I hate to say it. Barriers to entry are barriers to entry. It's the first thing you learn in Business 101. This is not conspiracy theory, okay? Get as many barriers to entry in, uh, as possible in place so that you don't have as much competition. That's better for your bottom line. That's better for your shareholders. Okay, I get it, okay? But come on. <laughs> There has to be a tipping point. There has to be some ability for us to, 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 to get in. Passionate scientists, just like me, all over the country, you know, all of, just the United States, we want in. We want in, okay? And I don't know how else to do it. I don't have a million dollars to go fill somebody's campaign coffers. I don't have it. It's actually more than a million dollars. I actually know the, what the price tags are, because <laughs> I did my digging.